I, uh, sorry. I'll get out of your office. I was just... It's not my office anymore? She stopped before I could finish. It's... what? It's not my office, she repeated. Someone bought out my contract. Not my office. Not my problem. I just came to get some stuff I left in here, she explained. But what about the whole ruin of my life thing? I asked, looking around to make sure nobody was trying to sneak up behind me and brain me with a baseball bat or something. I'm sure I'll get around to it, but you were right. I should have thought about it before I got in over my head like that. Well, I didn't actually tell you not to. I just kind of laughed and left you to your impending miss- Why did you just say I was right? I asked, wondering what alternate reality I just slipped into. You didn't even admit I was right when you were pretending not to hate me. And then she just stopped talking altogether. So I took that as my chance to slip away with the security footage. But with the nagging thought in front of my brain, who do I give my rent money to? You're never going to guess who I just ran into, I said to Rissa when I walked back inside. Who? She asked from a place on the couch where she'd been laying with a couple of ice packs on her knees. Harley just showed up out of nowhere. Also, what are you doing? I asked as her eyes widened at the statement. Where the hell is she? Rissa asked as she sat up. And I'm icing my knees. Don't think this body is used to pedaling around the bicycle all night. What? No, 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 don't do that. It's bad for you, I told her, walking over and taking the packs off her knees. Limp upstairs. There's a few heating pads in my closet. Use those and take some aspirin for the soreness. But my knees are swollen. Aren't you supposed to use ice for swelling? She asked as I set the ice packs on the table. The swelling is your body doing what it's supposed to so it can heal. The cold slows all that down. Heat helps the circulation and speeds up the healing a little. I explained as I rummaged around the kitchen. God damn it, where's that aspirin? Madison got into it, didn't she? She eats that shit like it's candy. I keep forgetting you two dated. You know her really well, don't you? She asked as she stood up. Better than I'd like to. Why? Is it true you never really beat her in a race? She added without explanation. No! Only in the crits. I always win the alley cats. She's just got those long ass legs and her upper body isn't that big so she's aerodynamic and... I always win the alley cats! I guess it's a touchy subject. <laughs> she said with a laugh as she made her way upstairs. Okay, time to take a break from solving murders and go deliver food to monsters. I mumbled later that night as I turned the app on. Oh, a new location. These are always great. I said to myself as I looked down at what I decided would be the last drop off for the night. And then I looked at the drop destination. It had the regular line over the route, but when it got to the actual location the dot was usually there, well it wasn't. Huh, must be a glitch, I thought as I stuffed the phone away in my bag. As you may have guessed, it was in fact not a glitch. After picking up the order from the local restaurant, I gave my phone one more look to see if anything had changed with the location, and it hadn't. But now there was a new special instruction. Lean up against the wall under the bricks that don't match the rest. Except the letters were... Well, they didn't look right. It was like the spacing was all wrong. The W and the A in the wall overlapped, and the uh, I and the C in the bricks. They were too far apart, and some of the letters were blurry. The whole thing was just wrong. Then I checked the tier level. There wasn't one, which hadn't happened since Adlin added the system, which didn't do all that much to ease my nerves, but pushing back against my better judgment was basically second nature to me at this point. So, bricks that don't match the rest. I said to myself as I searched the walls of the alleyway the app had led me to. What is that even supposed to ma- Oh yeah, there it is. I stopped as I looked up at a small patch of bricks to the right of the dumpster. Where the rest of the grimy bricks ran long ways across the length of the alley, there was a small cluster where they abruptly ran straight up and down. I wouldn't have noticed it if I had been looking for it, but now that I was, it was just unsettling. 
Like those pictures on the internet of things like a pizza with a piece cut out of the center. It's hard to explain, but I just found it very unpleasant to look at. But I still had a delivery to make. So I walked up to it and leaned my back against the wall as I watched the calico cat trot down the alley with a mouse in its mouth. Next thing I knew, I was laying on my back looking up at the harsh glare of a fluorescent light. My first thought was, what the hell happened? But pursuant to that was, oh my god, did I just smash the food? After panicking and checking to see if everything was okay, I stood up to see where I'd just ended up. And I had absolutely no idea. But I was nowhere near any kind of wall. I was standing in the center of a massive room, hundreds of yards long in all directions, and then I looked up. The room seemed to rise forever. I couldn't see the ceiling. The plain concrete walls rose on and on and on until they converged into the distance as a small, seemingly unreachable black dot. Row after row after row of floors peeking out as shadowy black lines over the sharp lines of their edges. I was suddenly overtaken by a sensation that was what I had assumed floating alone in the middle of the ocean felt like. I was so small inside something so massive and unfathomable. Not knowing where I was or how to get out or what to do next. Fighting back the panic, I took out my phone again to see if anything had changed. Now the special instructions had changed to... Ascend. Ascend? Ascend my ass! I shouted as I looked up at the endless rows of floors. How do I even get up there? There's no... Oh, wait, a door. I said as I noticed a small rectangle on one of the far walls. I could feel my anxiety start to build as I made my way across the wide, open space towards the door. Each step feeling as unnatural as the next, and the one before. And then I realized what it was. It was like I was walking the wrong way. Not like the wrong direction, but the process was backwards. Instead of feeling of moving myself forward to the door, it was a sensation that, with each step, I was pulling the ground underneath my feet, dragging the destination close to me with each step, not me moving in space at all. The second I noticed, I began to feel almost nauseous and off balance. Before long, my legs had started to wobble, barely hold me up. By the time I reached the door, I was on my hands and knees, desperately hoping that the sensation would go away once I passed through it. Once the door was open, I could see the long hallway that bent hard to the left, so I dug myself off the concrete floor and onto the carpet that would have been at home in the 1980s, maybe in a movie theater. Slowly pulling myself to my feet, I took a step and let out a sigh of relief when I noticed the sensation had gone away. So I decided to try and hurry and make my way to... wherever I was supposed to be going. Once I started walking down the hall, it was immediately apparent that I was going in a circle. No entrance, no exit, just an enclosed loop. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. I started chanting to myself in a building, panicked realization that I was trapped in an endless circle. Then, finally, as I tried to catch my breath, I decided to turn around and walk the other way. And to my amazement... Once the part of the hall I was standing in was out of sight, I was leaving the hallway and walking out into another open space. It wasn't as massive and cavernous as the first one, but I immediately got the impression of an old parking garage, or at least a level of one. The ceiling was very close to the top of my head. The walls to my sides were coated in grime and had water leaking down to the floor. Before long, I noticed a faint humming of fluorescent lights scattered sparsely across the ceiling as it stretched into the distance in front of me. As I walked down the open path, the white space in the distance slowly came into view. Once I got closer, I could start to tell that it was a new room, like the lobby of a hotel. It had a few pieces of furniture strewn across the floor and a random cheap painting here and there along the walls. As I walked into the new space, I turned to look back at where I came from, and it wasn't there. The strange, dimly lit concrete area had vanished, and now looked exactly like the room I was currently standing in. I wanted to think about how I was supposed to find my way back out, 
No one would start freaking out if I focused on it for too long. Just make the delivery. Just make the goddamn delivery, and then you can go home to your movies and your couch, and Halloween's a few days away. Just make the delivery, Jose, and then you can go home. I keep saying, trying to comfort myself, pretending I knew I'd be okay once I was done. As I wandered through the hotel lobby-like space for a while, I found another hall that snaked off to the side near the far wall from where I'd entered. As I walked down the new hall, I checked just to make sure, and just like before, the previous space was gone, replaced by a continuance of the one I was in now. And at that point, I found myself standing in an enclosed space, like an office building. But instead of a sea of cubicles you'd normally see, it was completely empty. The only sound was the soft hum of the fluorescent lights overhead. Known by then that I could only keep pressing forward, I made my way deeper into the desolate office space. By then, almost having completely given up on finding any signs of life. And then, went paint. I could smell a hint of fresh paint. Following the scent I investigated, Searching the office and all the individual rooms and offshoot hallways as I slowly walked farther and farther in. And then, finally, a sound from around the corner. It sounded like music. I poked my head around to see a radio sitting on an old milk crate next to a bucket of paint and a rolling pan. I scanned over the rest of the room to find the painter, but it looked empty. And then I felt hot breath on my neck. And that's when I looked at the ground to see the enormous shadow of whatever was looming over me. I listened to the heaves of it breathing and felt my legs start to shake as I slowly turned to face it. I was staring right into a pair of bright red eyes before their owner says, Finally, I'm starving. You're the delivery guy, right? But, uh, what? Oh yeah, th th that's me. I wheezed as I fought back the shock of turning to face an eight feet tall, horned, hoofed beast of a creature standing over me. I uh, think it might be cold by now. I've been walking around here for what feels like forever. I explained as my nerves started to calm down. Oh yeah, no. Look here. He said as he reached over me and unzipped my bag. Taking the food out and showed me the steam coming off it. How the hell? I know the bag's insulated, but I've been wandering around for like an hour. Oh, right, right. You see, time don't work the same way in here, little pal. The thing said, and what I finally realized was either a Wisconsin or Minnesota accent. Wait, are you a Minotaur? I'm still not up to date with all this mythology stuff, but still. Oh, little fella. I'm the Minotaur. I'm the last one as far as I know. You want a subdimensional space like this? I am the one to call. He bragged as he opened his food and walked over to where the radio was. So you can mess with space? I asked, curiously falling behind. Pretty much. So then time, what, moves slower in here? I asked. Well, yeah, in the same way. Some of it does. It's all connected there, you know. Space, time, gravity. You can't do something to one without doing something to the other. I can't just directly stop time, but I can tickle space and gravity just right to slow time to a crawl in certain spaces. Great off is it has to speed up somewhere else to balance it out. So I set some places up in here to be spaces where time skews faster. You've been doing this long enough, you can single out a little space as it moves around. Like the food in my bag to keep it hot whilst I wander around aimlessly in this disturbing nightmare place? I said, once he was done explaining. You got it there, little buddy, he answered. So, you're doing this for someone? Who? Some big lizard-looking fella. He wants this place connected to some water park all the way across town. He said as he sat the food down on a stack of milk crates. And also to some apartment over town for some reason. None of my business, though. Ah, that actually makes sense. Wait, apartments? Huh. It's starting to add up. 
So, uh, Mr. Minotaur guy, is there a map or something to get the hell out of here? I asked once I decided it was time to leave. Oh yeah, sure thing, little buddy. Over this way. He sat waving me along as he made his way to a door at the other side of the room. Let me just set this thing up for you in a jiffy. He added as he waved his hand over the door, causing several bright red symbols to glow across its surface for a few seconds before fading away again. There, that ought to do ya. That's gonna take ya right back to where you came in. And he was right. After walking down a small hallway, I found myself in a gigantic room with the endless ceiling. And at the other end, I could see a door in the space I entered through. So I stepped down onto the floor to leave and... Oh god, there it is again. I groaned, my legs wobbling under me. What the hell is that? I sighed, deciding to just give up and start crawling the hallway. Once I reached the other side, I pulled myself back up on the knob and gave the door a shove. What the hell? I thought as I watched the same cat continue walking from the exact spot I was when I fell through the wall. I swear, every time I'm getting used to this shit, something like this happens and- it Ah! I screamed as I turned away from the cat and almost ran face first into the goddamn maid again. What you doing? She asked, leaning forward and rocking on her heels. Hanging out in empty alleys? Seems suspicious. Can we not do this now? I've been swamped with this mock thing and I... I will pay you to- I thought we established your money's no good with me. She interrupted, giving her head a little mocking tilt to the side. Then how about... I whispered digging through my backpack. I'm not that easy to get- This! Out. I shouted, whipping out the half a cookie I bought with my Subway sandwich earlier, stopping her mid-sentence. Is that? Half a triple chocolate Subway cookie? Yes. Yes, it is. I finished for it. And it could be yours if you just... Buck. Off. Deal. She said before snatching it from my hand and vanishing with a poof of black mist. Well, if nothing else, she keeps her word. Need to buy more Subway cookies. I said quietly to myself as I walked over to my bike that I half expected to be gone by the time I got back. I caught myself almost apologizing to Rissa for leaving her out there before I remembered she wasn't stuck in the bike anymore. Well, at least I made a killing on that delivery. I said to myself when I heard the phone bing to show what I made for the order. But the fuzzy feeling went away when I realized that meant it had to have been a particularly dangerous drop. After that debacle, I was so exhausted that I decided to pack it in and head home even though it was just one job at peak delivery hours. But there were more riders by then and I knew if I didn't hurry and turn the app off, I'd end up getting clotheslined by a gargoyle or something. So I switched the app off and started pedaling back home. I could already feel my eyes getting heavy as I made my way back to the apartment, occasionally shaking off the grogginess as I snaked my way through the evening traffic. Then as I passed by a row of cars parked along the side of the road, I see a small girl stumble out of the road right in front of me, only feet away by the time she stepped out. All I had time to do was tighten up and brace myself, knowing we were both about to get hurt. Then the impact never came. The only thing I felt was my bike wobble underneath me from flinching, and that was it. I whipped my head around to see what happened to her, but she wasn't there. The street behind me was completely empty. Normally, I'd have assumed I was hallucinating, but given the past month, I slowed to a stop and went back to the place I saw her. Uh, hey, are there any ghosts around here? I asked to the open air, desperately hoping nobody was around to hear me. After standing around like a complete jackass for several minutes looking for a little girl ghost, I finally gave up and pedaled off down the street. I'm not seeing things. I'm not seeing things. I kept saying to myself the entire way home, hoping I wasn't actually hallucinating. By the time I got back to the apartment, Rissa and Madison were there, which wasn't unusual for the average night when I'd get home a lot later. But since I'd come back earlier, and they had still already beat me there, it was a little weird. 
Hey, what's going on? I asked as I walked inside. Huh? Never mind us. What happened to you? You look more nervous than usual. Marissa asked when she saw me. Oh, yeah. We had delivery. Literally fell into a different dimension. It was... weird. She finished for me. Yeah, that's it. So what are you guys doing back so early? I asked again. Oh, yeah, we're helping Destiny with her Halloween costume. Oh, shit, you aren't allowed to see her yet! She suddenly shouted upstairs. Destiny, don't come down! Jose just got back! What? What is he doing back so soon? He can hear you, you know! I called back up. It's kind of like I live here or something! It's okay, Dast. We'll come up there. Marissa said as her and Madison went upstairs. Ah, yes. Sorry to disturb you all in my home. I grumbled as I sat down at the kitchen table, still trying to sort through what happened to Mark. There was something stirring around in my mind, like a connection that just hadn't clicked yet. Something that would seem so obvious when it finally came to me, but I just couldn't pin it down for some reason. And then, before I knew it, it was Halloween. As I clambered around the apartment trying to kill time until the party at the mansion, I got a text from Destiny. Hey, Abigail's been really busy and couldn't get the costume ready in time. Can you get her one before the party tonight? It read. What am I a dad now? And doesn't she already have an entire shop literally full of costumes? I asked myself as I typed, yeah sure, onto the screen. What kind? I asked. But after waiting for about 10 minutes without an answer, I decided to just go find one. Now good people, please understand that I walked out the door that day with the very best of intentions. I really did. But once the pain in my side from the beanbag started to come back about halfway there, evil began to stir in that black little heart of mine. So what's this supposed to be? Abigail asked when I handed her the costume. So, uh, like a Sailor Moon type thing? You know, the Japanese sailor school uniforms? I said, fine back the smirk with every ounce of my strength. Weren't those mostly white? This looks mostly black. And did one of them wear glasses? I can't remember. She asked as she looked at the collection of various things I'd assembled myself at the costume shop. And this seems, I don't know bit more modest oh this is the new generation you know have to make everything politically correct these days ha ha i lied right through my goddamn teeth god destiny is gonna kill me but it'll be so worth it i thought as abigail kept examining the items what's with that look she suddenly asked look what look you had this look on your face just now she said, narrowing her eyes at me. What are you up to? Huh? Nothing. Just remembering a funny joke. You ever heard the one about the guy who goes to Spain on a business trip? Holy hell, that was close. I sighed once I finally left the shop and was on my way home. After I got back, I went straight to the shower to get all the sweat and junk off me before I dug my Dracula costume out and got ready for the party. Hey, you guys ready yet? I shouted upstairs where Rissa and Madison were both getting ready. A ride's almost here. I added before my phone beeped with a text. From Destiny. Oh shit, here we go. I said as I opened the message. Hey babe, did you get Abigail a Halloween costume for the party tonight? It read. So I carefully typed out as casually as possible. Yeah, I dropped it off at a shop earlier. And hit send. Come on, guys, I only have a few minutes left to live. Gotta make it count! I shouted up to Rissa and Madison one more time. Yeah, we're coming. Wait, what did you say? Rissa asked, poking her head around the corner at the top of the stairs. I have, I've set a series of events in motion that's about to lead to my inevitable demise as soon as Destiny finds out. Because when she tells Abigail, Abigail's gonna fold me like a shirt, so let's hurry up, please, I answered. We all piled into the back of the Uber by the time... Jose, what did you do? Destiny's next text read. And there it is. Rissa, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you, I said solemnly, looking over at her. 
Madison, it's been... Yeah. Whatever do you mean? I tap down on the screen and hit send. Okay, for real, what did you do? Madison asked. My last text barely having time to send before my phone beat with Destiny's next one. Oh, it has an attachment. I groaned, opening it and reading the next accompanying text. Explain this. It said, above it a picture of Abigail standing obliviously in her costume. Oh my god, Jose, you didn't! Rissa suddenly shrieked. What? What's going on? Madison tried to ask. It's probably better you don't get it. Rissa assured her as she looked at me with concern. Destiny's about to kick your ass, you know that, right? And then probably Abigail, too. Told you. And it had to be done. I said defiantly as we were driven to the mansion. For a while, there was an awkward silence until we heard the driver say, Oh, sweet, new video. And audio started playing softly from the speakers in the front. It wasn't until after several times of thinking I heard something that sounded familiar that I finally asked, Hey, buddy, what are you listening to up there? Oh, sorry, is it bothering you? I can turn it off. Nah, I'm just curious, I told him. What is it? Huh? Oh. You familiar with uh, creepypastas? The driver asked over his shoulder. You know, online stories about ghosts and murders and monsters and crap like that? Vaguely, I answered after a long pause when me and Rissa exchanged looks. This guy on YouTube narrates them. I mean, that's not all that special, but this guy does all the crazy voices for the characters. Gets all into it and everything. Not great for going to sleep, but if you need something to keep you up and entertained on a long work night... He's a guy. Yeah, I think I might have heard of him. I sighed, thinking back to the hammer-wielding, walking shampoo commercial I conned into narrating my memoirs. I can't believe you let her show up like that! Destiny roared at me as she stampeded through the front entrance as soon as we pulled up. Remember me when I'm gone? I said to Rissa as I began my slow shuffle to meet Destiny. Have you lost your twisted little mind? She bellowed into my face. Who would even carry that costume? Never mind how you found one. I didn't. I put it together myself. It was actually a lot of work. Hush! She snapped, sticking her finger in my face. Do you have any idea? Oh, there you are. Abigail suddenly spoke up from behind Destiny. Thanks for the costume. People have been complimenting it ever since I got here. Spinning around, causing the skirt to whirl around like a fan. Oh, we still haven't explained it to her yet, I asked. No, and I'm not going to. Destiny hissed back at me. Do you have any idea how embarrassed she'll be? Oh, well, too late, I said, looking over her shoulder at Rissa, who was now standing next to Abigail with her phone out. Shit! Destiny squealed as she tried to stop it, but it was already too late. Abigail was already flipping through the digital pages. Oh, is that all? She suddenly asked after a few minutes of her reading. I was all standing there in stone-cold silence. What do you mean, is that all? Risha asked back. That's like super messed up what happened to her. Eh, I've had worse. Abigail said casually as she handed Risha a phone back and tried to walk away. Wait, hold on! Risha asked, stopping her as she made her way inside the mansion. What do you mean you've had worse? So Abigail paused for a second before walking back over to Rissa and Madison and started to talk to them quietly. Then, after some time passed, Rissa walked over to where I was and punched me dead in the fucking nose. Hard! Like with technique. Planted her foot through a fucking shoulder into it. My head snapped back and I made a weird ass knock sound. My legs buckled a little. You're an asshole! She yelled at me before storming off back into the manor. Holy shit, I really thought I'd end up punching him way before Rissa. Madison said with a chuckle before following Rissa inside, who had tears starting to well up in her eyes. Uh, I really don't get what just happened, I said to Destiny as I held my nose. Uh, well... I think it's just concerning to me that you don't know about Abigail's history. 
about how she became a vampire and everything that happened over the years. I don't think Rissa realized that either, so she thought you gave her that costume to, you know, mock her? Why? What happened? I don't think it's for me to tell you. If you really want to know, you should just ask Abigail, and if she wants you to know, she'll tell you. Oh, oh no, it's bleeding, she suddenly added, holding her cupped hand out onto my nose. Come on, let's go take care of this, she said, tilt my head back and lead me inside. Hey, what are you... Destiny, are you licking my nose blood? I was curious, and you never let me when I ask. Because it's weird! I interrupted her before she could finish a sentence. My head still tilted back, holding my nose up in the air. That came out of my nose! Oi! I was wondering when you show up! I suddenly heard Jekyll say as he walked past the room that normally held the ridiculously long table. But that night the table was gone, and the floor was open with people dressed in their costumes. Film the room from wall to wall. The hell happened to you? Risa punched him in the nose. Destiny explained as she continued on, aiming me towards one of the bathrooms. Punched him? Why in the world would she punch him of all people? Jackal asked as he followed us behind. It's a long story. I answered in a nasally voice from trying to pinch my nose closed. Ain't exactly a lot of short ones with you, is there? He said as he finally wandered off into a different direction before calling back. Gotta say, you got some bollocks on you to pick that costume. Okay, you stay here until the bleeding stops. I'm going to my room to put my costume on. She told me as she opened the door to walk out into the hallway. Behave while I'm gone. Once my nose dried up and I crept out of the bathroom to finally join the party, which at that time was still growing. It was weird seeing that many people in the mansion all at once, you know? And it not being under siege. Then, after I grabbed a rum and coke from the bar to help numb my throbbing nose, I decided to wander around the dining hall for a while. I remember thinking how strange it was to be at a Halloween party in Dracula's house and not think it was all that strange. Jesus Christ, I think I'm getting used to it, I thought to myself. Pretty sure I could have squeezed a few more things in there somewhere. Then, just as the thought passed between my ears, Destiny finally walked into the room in a Velma costume. Well, how does it look? She asked, pretty much rhetorically, since all I could do was stand there wide-eyed and slack-jawed. It's a... Uh, I, um... Thank you. She chirped as she played with the hem of her orange sweater and adjusted her glasses. Come on, walk with me. She said, grabbing my hand. What's in the glass? Oh, uh, rum and coke. Give me a drink. She said, taking the glass from me. Oh my god, you said it was rum and coke! She coughed after taking a sip. Well, there's coke in it. Somewhere. It's for my nose, I explained. Jeez, that was awful. She groaned as we walked up to the table with all the refreshments and used a ladle to pour some fruit punch into a plastic cup. Now, I can't even remember the last time I used that word. Ladle. Ladle, 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 ladle. Ladle, ladle, and now it's lost all its meaning. Come on, this way. She directed as we left the dining room. You've never really been given a real tour of the manor, have you? She asked as I staggered along behind her. Actually, no. The most I ever saw was when we were both running for our lives and ducking gunfire, I answered. And usually, there's only a few rooms I'd use when I'm here. Hmm, then you might like this. She hummed as she pushed open a large wooden door. It's the library, she told me as she walked into the huge room. The walls covered end to end in books upon books upon books. Then I noticed that among all the other shelves were three smaller shelves near the middle of the far wall. Hey, what's going on back there? I asked her as I pointed to them. Oh, those are our shelves. Me and my sisters, I mean, she explained, leading me over to them. Dad gave us each one to put our own books on. Ah, that's pretty neat, I said as I looked at the one marked with Destiny's name over. Then I noticed a row that was solid yellow. 
All the same book by the looks of it. Hey, what's with this shelf? I asked, kneeling down to get a closer look. Oh, that. I was the only one who thought that having a book written about him was pretty cool, she told me. So I asked Mr. Stoker to send me a few copies if the book got published. She went on as I slid one of the yellow-covered novels off the shelf. I felt my hands start to tremble as she said. But he sent me a whole crate of them instead. Half of them are still boxed up. Dest, you have an entire shelf of first edition Dracula novels. Destiny! Destiny, these look brand new! Yeah, what's the big deal? She asked, kneeling down next to me. The big deal? These are all perfect, perfect condition. First editions of one of the most influential works of fiction ever written. I tried to explain. Do you have any idea what first editions sell for? I don't know. I've never really looked. Like, a few hundred dollars, maybe? What are you doing? She asked as I pulled out my phone and opened the bookmarks in my browser. Look, I told her. Holding up the saved listing for a really good condition, first edition copy I'd run across while looking for my costume. What's that say? She asked, taking the fake glasses off. $25,000? She squealed all of a sudden. Well, I guess that explains how I was able to trade one for my hearse. She sighed. I never knew they were so valuable. It's like finding a buried treasure, I said as I looked over and over. Wait, what about your hearse? Oh yeah, there was this guy who knew my dad. He owned this special effects company that did stuff for a lot of big movies. They had that hearse left over from a movie that got cancelled during pre-production. So he said that if I could get my dad to sign a copy to give to his grandson as a present, he'd give me the pink hearse, she explained. Took me forever to talk him into it. I listened as I slowly, carefully opened the cover of one. Um, Destiny? Did Bram Stoker sign every one of these? Oh yeah, I think so. She answered, opening another to check. Looks like it. I slid the book back into place and picked up my phone again. Look, I said holding it to her face. Oh, six... Sixty thousand?! Jesus, Destiny, you're a millionaire just by your book collection. I sighed, took my phone back into my pocket. Oh, well then, check this out. That's not even close to the rarest book I have. She told me, walking over to a small glass case. Look at this. There were only ever five printed. It's by this English poet that had an episode. Set fire to the printing company after the first preview copies were printed and mailed out. One got burned in the fire later on. One's missing, stolen I think. I have one, Hook has one, and some collector has the last one. What makes it so important? I asked, leaning close to the case. It was supposed to be the first time these poems were ever put into print. Normally he'd write them down but only perform them live. So you'd have to actually be in front of him. And it wasn't just the writing but how he'd recite the poems, like he was speaking from some deep place of unimaginable melancholy. I saw one of his performances, and... She suddenly stopped, her voice quivering a little at the end. Hey, what's the big deal? I asked clumsily. But she didn't say anything. She just slowly lifted the glass dome away from where the book was resting and gingerly opened the cover. She stared down at it for a while before she finally spoke again. He died in the fire. I never knew why he did it. I got the book the same day I got the telegram. She said as her voice got more and more shaky. I looked down at the dried tear stains blotting the writing scrawled all across the back side of the cover. Oh, I think I get it now. You and him. <laughs> she said with a sniffle. That was... 115 years ago. I heard some people talking about a poet coming to town that everybody should see. So I went to his show and it was the most beautiful thing. 
it's hard to describe. And then at the end he'd suddenly stop and say, it's not proper that anyone leave this place with a frown. And he'd tell the crowd his favorite jokes and recite a few funny poems he wrote whilst acting them out. And by the end we were all laughing together. I walked over to him once it was over and introduced myself. And when I did, he said the most charming thing. He said, Destiny? No, surely not. Your name must be Fortune. For Fortune has surely smiled on me this evening. And that made me smile. So then he just smiles back and gives his head this little tilt like, Ah, told you so. Well, shit. I gotta work on my language skills. How's a guy compete with that? I grumbled a little jealous that I could never think of something that smooth to say. <laughs> Shut up, she said with a little laugh. I'm sorry. I just realized I haven't thought about any of this in so long. I got a little overwhelmed. It's okay. What are you talking to? I just got shocked in the face by a ghost wearing the body of my dead girlfriend who got killed by a hand-eaten crocodile monster. We both got some insane crap in our backstory, I added, giving her a hug and holding my glass up to her. Want to give it another try? Yes, give me that, she exclaimed, snatching it out of my hand and gulping it down all at once. Come on, that's not going to do the job, she instructed as she headed for the door. So I carefully closed the book back and placed the glass case back over it before following her behind. Oi! The Einstein of a Dr. Jekyll said from beside me a little while later. Destiny's right, sozzled. She's... what? I asked as I watched her play in a game of whack-a-mole. Horribly. Mallet in one hand, drink in the other, her brown Velma wig now gone. To where we did not know. Sozzled, you know. Sloshed. On the lash. Legless. Off a tree. Smashed. Tipsy. Your girl's fucking pissed right off her ass, mate. Oh, you mean drunk? Yeah, just let her have her fun. I told him as we watched her hammer away on the machine that it already stopped about 30 seconds ago. She was telling me about this poet guy she had a thing for forever ago, and I guess it just pressed the right button. Poet? Oh, right, right, I remember that. I hadn't been with him that long back then. What a wreck that poor girl was for the longest time. Say, did she ever tell you what caused that little fit with a box of diaries? He asked out of the blue. Oh, no, I kind of forgot about it, really, I answered. Why? Well, I suppose that ain't all that big of a deal. See, right after the man buried himself alive in that building, poor girl didn't know how to make heads or tails or something like that happening to her. So, she developed a wee bit of a crush. On the old Jekyll. She. I'm sorry, what? I asked flabbergasted. Yeah. Now I know what you might be thinking. Dr. Jekyll's a filthy degenerate. But he won't take advantage of a broken-hearted, grieving woman like that. Please stop referring to yourself in the third person. You see, she'd leave little letters and such under the door of my lab and in my pocket and my coat, things like that. But eventually the old girl came to her senses and forgot all about it. He said, give me a pat on the back. She'll got a good taste of men now, don't she? <laughs> I said flatly as I watched her prowl the area for another game to play. One thing's for sure, lad. You ain't gonna do any better than that beautiful creature over there. She thinks the sun rises out your ass and sets in your navel. So you best keep that in mind. Spoke into my ear before rejoining the party. And then Abigail comes waddling up to me. I say waddle because she was off balance, carrying a large part of something that must weigh about as much as she did. So, what you got there? I asked, actually kind of curious about what was in the huge container. Chili? She declared, almost proudly as she passed by. Nope, I can't just let that one go. I sighed to myself, let my arms slap down lazily to my sides as I jogged to catch up with the pocket-sized vampire carrying a giant pot of chili. My god, my life is a circus. 
So, chili, you say? I asked once I caught up to her. Yep, chili. Chili for the chili cook-off. Whoa, whoa! I shouted, jumping in front of her to block away. I love chili! How did nobody tell me about this? You do? Well, we actually need one more judge. Interested? Hell yes. I told her as she started to walk around me. Finally, this night's starting to pick up. Abigail, this shit is burning my eyes, and I haven't even tasted it yet. What? Ugh. What's up? I asked as I sat at the judge's table with the samples in front of me in their tiny little bowls. It's a hot chili contest, duh. Large part of the score goes to how spicy it is. She explained that she gave her bowl a tiny nudge my way. I win every year. And every year I come up with something new to keep it interesting. Makes things fair. She bragged, pulling a list up on her phone. And then I made the mistake of reading them. In preparation, I've since retrieved a copy of this list, just so I don't forget anything and you get the full effect. They came with a name, and then underneath, they had their own captions or warnings. Straight liquid. Chunkless. No chunks. Not a single chunk at all, so help me God. Double barrel. First round. Fought. Second round. Shot. False positive. No, that's not sweat running down your leg. Grim empathy. Farts aren't supposed to be lumpy. Many colored master blaster disaster. Forcefully fire a modern art masterpiece deep into the cushions of your couch. Tony's rectal welder. You can't have diarrhea if your butthole's melted shut. Somebody shit your pants. A riveting whodunit mystery for the whole family. Abigail's unforgettable chili. These farts are gonna itch when they dry. And the last one just said, I made you eat your parents. Uh, I think I changed my mind. I suddenly squealed as I tried to jump up out of my seat and make a break for it. But I felt her tiny hand shove me back down into the folding chair. Abigail? I'm scared. I whimpered, also a little mad that I just realized Abigail might be low-key funnier than I am. Don't worry, it'll pass when you start to ring, she assured me. And then the contest began. The first taste set my entire mouth on fire. You could have shot paint thinner up my nose, and it wouldn't have flushed my sinuses out as fast as that chili. The second one actually tasted really good. So I was told. I don't know, the first one apparently nuked the part of my tongue that could taste anything other than pain. I'm assuming it was about as hot as the first one, since I didn't feel any additional burning. The third one had something like celery in it. I could tell by the smell there was now a straight line directly from my nostrils to my brain. By the fourth one, my vision started to get a little fuzzy. Nor my head started to vibrate. One or the other. The fifth one was the one that introduced me to an entirely new tier of hot. I made the mistake of letting this one touch my lips, which had previously been lucky enough to go unmolested. Ever had your bottom lip pierce with a dull wood burner? Well, I could probably describe the sensation to a reasonable degree of accuracy. And the sound someone makes when it happens. At one point during this time, I got caught up in the middle of a fit of hiccups, but eventually I fought it and apparently that normalized my internal pressure and stopped the hiccups. The only problem was the crowd of people who'd amassed behind me. By the time I was able to slowly twist my body around to apologize, they were already gone without a trace. To this day, I'm still not sure if they ran away or were all instantly vaporized in the blast of scorching wind roaring out of my rectum. I think I blacked out for most of the sixth one, but that's okay. I regained some consciousness in time for the seventh. Oh, the seventh. Let me tell you guys about the seventh. Once the first one started, the seventh finished. By then, the words on my review card were a little more than shaky scribbles I made by clumsily stabbing at the paper through water eyes whilst thinking of the smallest words I could. And then it was time for Abigail's I Made You Eat Your Parents Chili. I have no memory beyond putting it in my mouth. 
There's only the cell phone footage of me sitting slumped over, wide-eyed in my chair, a stream of chili juice snaking its way out of my open mouth and down the front of my shirt as I gurgled lazily for what little oxygen I could unconsciously force into my lungs. I woke to a sound like running water that eventually became words. Should we call an ambulance? I heard someone say as I realized I was laying on my back in the grass, staring up at the night sky. No, no, I, I'll be okay. I just need some milk or a cow or something. I groaned as I wobbled to my feet. Has anyone seen my girlfriend? I asked with one last hiccup once I was upright and steady. Oh yeah, you're the guy dating the Count's daughter, aren't you? She's over there. Someone with horns said, pointing towards the table across from the one I'd been sitting at. As I watched, I caught a look over at me and wave, so I started to wave back. Then I caught sight of Abigail rearing back, ball in one hand, first place chili cook-off trophy in the other, tongue sticking out the side of her mouth at one of those knock-the-milk-jugs-over games. Oh god, Abigail, no! I shouted running over to stop it before she killed the guy working the game, and everyone behind him. Have you lost your m- Are you drunk? I asked as I snatched her off her feet before she managed to wipe the booth off the face of the earth. Not yet, but I'm working on it. Put me down, your daughter's coming this way. Yep, she's drunk too, I said to Destiny as I sat her down. She thinks I'm your dad. Oh, yay! She's such a fun drunk. Let's follow her around and see what she does. Destiny suggested, clapping her hands together in excitement. This is always my favorite part of the party. Sometime later, a still very inebriated Destiny walks, staggers over to me and says, and I do quote, Hey, Jose, it's the time speech. Um, one more time, please. I asked, reaching out to hold her upright. She's trying to tell you it's almost time for that speech? A woman's voice spoke from behind me. Oh, hey, prophecy. Thanks. I don't think I could have figured that out on my own. I told her as I struggled to keep Destiny balanced on her feet. Well, I don't think I've seen her this wrecked in a long, long time. And we've been over this. Call me Fessy. And everyone but that does. She said as she took Destiny from me. Every year, Dad gives two speeches. One at this party, then one at the festival. Me and Miss Wobbly here are supposed to be up there with him, she explained. Ah, okay. Well, then I'll just... No, 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 no. She stopped me before I could finish talking. I'm supposed to bring you along, too. Me? What the hell did I do? You're supposed to come with me. That's all I know, she told me. No, let's go before my dad gets impatient. After that, she led us through the manor and upstairs to a balcony that overlooked the back lawn area where everyone had gathered. I never thought I'd be the one to have stage fright. But all those eyes looking up at me, most not even human, it was kind of unnerving. Especially because I had no idea what I was even doing up here. I stood there nervously waiting. Destiny propped up between mine and Prophecy's shoulders, until Hook eventually joined us on the balcony and told us the Count was on his way, before announcing to the crowd, Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us here this fine October night. This has been an eventful year for us all, to be sure, and seemingly will continue to be. So with no further ado, I introduce your host, Count Dracula! Uh, what's this? That was next name. Destiny mumbled drunkenly beside me. Fessy? Translation? I asked, looking over at her. She's saying that entrances are always memorable at these things. Yeah, you're in for one hell of a show. Chris suddenly said from my other side. Holy shit, when did you get here? I asked, noticing his usual blue hoodie was now red. A few seconds ago. Now pay attention. You're not going to want to miss this. He told me, pointing towards the crowd below. Right after he said that, I could see a familiar black mist snaking its way through the crowd. 
As it twisted and swirled, it rose from the ground to the balcony and began to solidify into the shape of a man. But it wasn't the Count I knew. What was standing in front of me was a figure that looked like it was made of an inky black void. Two large horns rose up from the top of his head and his chest glowed a bright yellow and orange like a furnace cast in a black silhouette of his ribs. His eyes shine in a deep red that seemed to bleed down into his face like a creeping fog. Then slowly, darkness fell away to reveal the count I'd come to know as he raised one hand to greet his guests. Good evening, everyone. I bid you all welcome. He spoke down to the crowd, every unblinking eye locked on him. I am so glad to see so many familiar faces. He suddenly stopped when he noticed me, taking a long pause as he took in my costume. Among you, so many happy, smiling faces. As my dear friend James has said, times such as these can be troubling. As I am sure many of you know, I have lost one of my daughters in recent months. After that, he paused for a second. I could see his fingers grasping uncomfortably at the railings before he made himself speak again. And as I am sure most of you have now heard, Mark of Dirty Work Inc. has also been murdered. Chris who I'm sure you all know will be taking Mark's place moving forward," he explained, gesturing to Chris. This is not what I intended to tell you only a few months ago, he continued. But current events withstanding, I'm afraid it must wait. Which brings me to... He paused as I felt a hand grip my shoulder and pull me up next to him. I looked to see the Count's fingers curled around my arm as he continued to look down at his audience. Many of you already know this young man, and a few of you who do not surely know of him, he said, making my stomach clench anxiously and having so much attention aimed at me so suddenly all at once. You know him not only because he has been providing a much needed service to many of us night after night, but also because of his exploits. Jose is singly responsible for devising the plot that allowed James and myself to bring both Pan and the Neveland Corporation to justice. When he said that, I could feel my face flush red with embarrassment as Destiny hiccuped next to me. <laughs> That's my boyfriend. She chirped happily before whispering to herself, Oh no, don't throw up. Do not throw up. What is wrong with her? Count suddenly leaned forward and whispered in my ear. Oh, uh, she may have had one too many refreshments. I whispered back. Oh, maybe about ten too many? I added, looking back at her. She... Her night started kind of rough. Hmm. He grumbled before he stood back up and continued. Not only that... But he went on to discover a plot to appropriate priceless paranormal artifacts in the process of solving the murder of his dear friend. Bet he didn't know you've become a bit of a local celebrity, huh? Prophecy asked, leaning over to whisper it behind the Count's back. Honestly, I really didn't, I answered with a shrug. I usually try to keep to myself. Young Jose has time and time again shown himself to be a dependable friend and servant to our community in this, our small corner of the world. Which is why he has volunteered to discover the perpetrator of Mark's demise. So please, give him your full cooperation if he should require it from you. The speech went on for a while longer, but once it finally ended, I was free to slink off back to the mansion as I helped Prophecy walk Destiny back to her room and stash her in a bed. Hey, you. Come walk with me for a while, Prophecy said, 
pulling her long red hair up into a ponytail. So what's this about? I asked as I followed her down the hall. I just thought we should get to know each other a little better. She answered from over her shoulder. You might end up being my brother-in-law after all. She added with a giggle. Hey, easy, don't start getting ahead of yourself, I warned her. Also, can you and Destiny, you know, go all apocalyptic like counted back there? Oh, um, I don't think so. Our moms were all just regular people. She told me she kept walking. That is, what's this saying these days? Built different? Like even in the paranormal world, he's big medicine. That's the point of that whole entrance. He's reminding them all a large collection of entities and creatures that could cause the world a whole lot of trouble. And if they step out too far, he's still there. And compared to him, how very small they are. Huh? You wouldn't think that from how he acts most of the time, but stopped as the thought occurred to me. What is it? Prophecy asked when she noticed I'd stopped following behind her. Now that you mention it, there were a couple of times that make me think, isn't it strange that someone as mellow as your dad has such, I don't know, gratuitously evil abilities? Hmm, yeah, I've kind of wondered about that too. Dr. Jekyll has been trying to figure him out. Well, him and us, she explained, spinning on a heel to face me. But he hasn't gotten very far, honestly. Oh, well, I, uh, I stopped myself as an extremely drunk Abigail wobbled her way past us and down the rest of the hall until she found Destiny's room, opened the door, and walked straight into the wall. <sighs> she growled and grumbled before switching sides and staggering inside. Move, move over, we heard her say before she shut the door behind her. Give me some blanket. Anyway... I said as we took a few more steps before stopping in front of another door. Here we go. Prophecy hummed before I could say anything else. My room. And what do you need from me exactly? Nothing. I'm just kind of a shut-in. More comfortable in my own room. She explained, twisting the knob and opening the door. I can see why. I mumbled under my breath as I looked at the space that had been covered wall to wall with... Yeah, kind of the family nerd. She said with a chuckle as my eyes scanned over the army of figurines and walls covered in scrolls and posters and shelves of DVDs and old vintage tapes and just general mountains of nerdiness. Might be putting it a little lightly, I think, I said as I walked in behind her. You got a lot of cool stuff in here, though. Yeah, now that they've been collecting it since, like, forever. She proudly told me as she plopped down onto a Pokeball patent beanbag. Oh, yeah. That's nice. I've been on my feet all day setting up everything for the party. What? Really? I think your dad would just hire people to do that. Yeah, but it's kind of tradition we all do it together. She explained as she pulled her shoes and socks off before tossing them across the room near the door. Wow, your feet. I said as she wiggled the toes into the air. Cute, huh? You a foot guy? They stink. I groaned through my pinched nose, like someone crawled into a skunk's ass and died. Shut up, they do not, she whined as she slid a pair of slippers on. Oh, what's that? I said to myself as I spotted the lights glowing from the far side of a room. Oh, my computer. I do a lot of stuff on the internet. What? She asked when she saw me staring at her suspiciously. Stuff? I asked back. What kind of... Stuff. I get what you're asking, and no, not that. Not that I'm opposed to it. I'm just too shy. I mean, like games, and I do playthrough videos and stuff. Oh, that explains the really good internet in this place. I mumbled, leaning down to look at the machine. This looks pretty fancy. I built it myself, she said proudly from her place on the beanbag. Oh, you really weren't kidding about the nerd thing. I want to ask you something, she suddenly informed me, an abrupt seriousness in her tone. Okay, what is it? Is there any way you can figure out who killed my sister? She asked bluntly, 
and the shock of the unexpected question given my insides a sharp twist. I want to know which person that night did it. Oh. And well, one way or the other, they'd be dead. Your dad made sure of that. But I already knew who it was. He explained as delicately as possible. The scene was pretty obvious. I was able to tell, even in the chaos. It's, it's gonna get a little gory, so tell me if you want me to stop. I warned it. She was stabbed in the chest by a sharpened piece of wood at an angle. So it passed through a left lung diagonally before reaching a heart. That caused it to aspirate blood for a short time. There was a body laying next to her. They were all wearing some kind of goggles, but there was blood splatter patterns that were consistent with if he was within arm's reach of her at the time the injury was inflicted. And he appeared to have died from massive trauma to his throat. A large mass of flesh was missing, which seemed to be in fate's hand after she died. Whoever killed her, she took with him. It was pretty obvious to me, at least. Oh. She responded with a heavy sigh. Well, at least I know. Thanks, she said as she leaned back in the beanbag. How do you know all that stuff? College. I went to get a degree in forensic science. Just decided I liked riding a bike instead, I answered. Seemed to be coming in handy lately, though. It's like whatever happens to you guys, you have to figure out and deal with on your own most of the time. Once we got her ulterior motive out of the way, I walked back out into the hall to head home to the apartment. And then I remembered I didn't have my bike. So I decided to walk back and take the time to think stuff over. And the whole way there, one thought was stuck in my mind. When I said the prophecy. It was pretty obvious. It hung over me the entire rest of the night and all the next day. I caught myself thinking about it as I made my deliveries. It wasn't until I was dropping off an assload of something that I knew would have made my bag smell like fish for weeks. As I was leaving, I caught sight of some of those people wearing white and ducked behind a few bushes before they could spot me. As they walked by, I noticed the little wings they had all tattooed over their pinky fingers. And then everything clicked into place all at once. Before long, I was standing in front of the dirty work ink shop, banging on the door trying to get someone to answer. Hey, open up! I think I figured something out! I shouted. Oi, what's the racket? I heard Jekyll's voice come from down the alley. What's the fuss all about? Oh, Jekyll! Hey! I think I solved Mark's murder. I came to tell them, but I think they aren't here. Oh, right, right. Yeah, they said it was all going to a bar tonight to unwind. Had a rough day, a lot of them. He explained. I was just passing by when I heard you try to tear the door down. Everything I can help with. Actually, yes. I'm soft and fragile, I told him. But you, you can help me bring the killer to them gift-wrapped and all, I said with a triumphant hum. What's got you all giddy? He asked as he followed me out of the alley. Oh, oh, oh yeah, lad, you got my attention now. He said excitedly as I whispered the answer into his ear. My night just got so much better. I'm just glad this headache is about to be over. Hey! Hey! I know you're in there! Open the goddamn door! I heard Louie pounding on the door downstairs in the middle of the night. I'm about to break this thing down! I heard Abigail interject. Open it! Open it! Open it! Open it! Hey, eh? What's going on? I asked them as I opened the door. Hey, uh... Rissa? I finished for him. My name's Rissa. Right. Have you heard from Jose? He shouted in my face in a wild sense of urgency. What the hell's going on? Madison asked as she came down the stairs behind me. We just went to bed. Why are you screaming? Look! Louis yelled again, shoving his phone screen in my face. Look at what? I groaned, pushing it away from me far back enough to read what he was trying to show me. Whoa, hold on. How long ago was this? A couple minutes ago. We came right down. 
But about the same time I got this, there was a whole bunch of explosions. And he hasn't answered any of the texts I've sent since then. He told us, his voice starting to get a little worried. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh god, oh no. He frantically repeated over and over, trying to think. What do we do? What if something bad happened to Jose? What if he's... I asked, feeling my eyes start to tear up. Hey, hey, calm down, sweetie. Madison stopped me, grabbing hold of one of my shoulders and spinning me in her direction. Now listen, there's two things I know. One, something bad definitely happened to Jose. Mm. I whimpered, getting ready to freak out again. Something bad always happens to Jose. You can set your watch by it. Ever since I've known him, he's been up to his ass crack in some kind of trouble. He just can't avoid it. But... She paused, holding a finger up to my lips when I started to speak. But the second thing I know is that he always gets out of it somehow. He can squirm and crawl and slither out of just about anything. So have some faith in him, okay? Yeah, listen to Madison. Louis said. I mean, I was seriously about two seconds away from putting a bullet in the little shit's head. He found his way out of that right away. He didn't even do nothing. And it was that shit heel of a deadbeat brother of his I was looking for the whole time. Whatever his intention, Louis's retelling of the time he almost murdered my best friend in cold blood in the middle of our apartment didn't exactly have a settling effect on me at the time. I could start to feel my anxiety come to boil as I let my mind wander through all the terrible possibilities of what could have happened. Hey, just sit down for a minute, Madison told me as she led me over to the couch. What are you doing? I asked as I eased myself down, using my shaking hands for support. Shh, it's gonna be okay. I'm gonna call Destiny and we're gonna have the entire monster squad out looking for him. She answered. She pulled her phone out and turned on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. She'll know what to do. I sighed as I sank back into the cushions. What do you mean something happened to Jose? Destiny shouted at the top of her lungs, popping out of nowhere in the middle of the room after Madison had sent the text. Tell me what is going on now! She roared on, snatching up Louie into the air. Hey, whoa, hey! Why are you coming after me? I didn't do nothing! He squealed. Look! He tried to text me something. He found out who killed Mark, and then the next message cut off, and there's a freaking big fucking explosion somewhere. He explained, shoving his phone into Destiny's face. Once she saw that, she let him drop down to the floor before snatching his phone away and examining the message. After thinking for a while, she looked over at Abigail, who had been pacing back and forth on the other side of the room. Abigail? Why... How are you here before me? She asked. But when she saw the worried look on her face, she changed her question. Hey, what's wrong? Suddenly, Abigail stopped and looked at her, nearly as close to tears as I was. But before she could answer, Destiny spoke again. You're worried about Jose too, aren't you? To which Abigail just nodded and sniffled before answering. He's my... He's my f You trying to say he's your friend too? Mm-hmm. She mumbled her response. I know. We're going to figure this out. Destiny assured her with a tremble in her voice. And I think I know who's going to be a big help. What do you mean something happened to Jose? Relic bellowed as he appeared suddenly across the room from me. I could feel a nausea wash over my whole body as my head started to split with pain. I couldn't see straight and everything felt like it was shaking as Relic stomped around the bottom floor of the apartment, his body flickering and warping all around the room wildly, making it hard to tell where he really was half the time. Hey, calm down! Please calm down! You're making them sick! Her destiny begged Relic, sounding like she was far off in the distance. And then everything suddenly returned to normal as Relic flopped down in the middle of the floor, seemingly not knowing what else to do with himself. Yeah, a lot of help that was. 
My brain was overdue for a good microwave, and after all... Louis complained sarcastically, resting his hands on his knees. Ah, oh, fuck, my nose is bleeding. So, what do we do now? I asked, knowing the longer we waited, the worse the situation might get. And after thinking for a little while, Destiny spoke up and said, That company you guys work for? They can track your phones, right? Help support the author on Patreon. Link in the description below.